Don't mind that little noise. That's good. Okay. Okay, oh, yeah. so uh, welcome everyone to the Shelter Bar webinar. Um, I'm Matthew Wells with Lethbridge County and I'll be your host. Um, as you may have noted, the webinar is being recorded and will play, be placed on the Lethbridge County website and YouTube channel either this Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, today's webinar won't be your typical webinar, as you see. Uh, instead, it'll be more of an informal discussion Q&A with our two guests whom I'll introduce shortly. We will follow a little structure. Um, so the questions aren't all over the place. Uh, first, we will discuss establishing a shelter boat, followed by disease and insect damage that is prevalent here in southern Alberta. And uh, we will end the webinar talking about uh, maintaining a healthy tree, or tree stand slash shelter belt. Uh, anyone that has any questions, please feel free to use the raised hand icon located, or located in the reactions tab. And I'll call on you to unmute yourself, or if you don't have a microphone, uh, make sure to use uh, the comment tab. Uh, with it being a discussion instead of a presentation, don't be afraid to chime in to the conversation either. Um, all I ask is when you're not speaking or asking a question, uh, just make sure to have your mic off. Um, I understand it is a busy time of the year for many, so if you can't stay long and you don't have a question, please do not hesitate to ask. I want to make sure everyone here can get their questions answered today. Uh, I'll start by introducing our two guests. Uh, we have two very knowledgeable individuals, our urban forestry, forestry specialists based out of Lethbridge. Uh, we have Grant Collins and, uh, from Grant Plant and Lindsay Bell from the city of Lethbridge. So welcome Grant and Lindsay. Uh, yeah. Lindsay. Grant. Grant's on left, Lindsay on the right. <clears throat> yeah. Very seldom right. But... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I guess we'll start off with uh, establishing your shelter belt. So uh, before your planting begins, um, is there a layout design one should consider, or are there places to avoid planting around your farmstead or even on the farm property? Go ahead, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I would consider the soil preparation the biggest issue. Yep. Um, locating your utilities and and the soil preparation would be the two biggest issues that I typically see are problems long term down the road they plant uh, you know tall species underneath power lines um, we've had a couple where we had to go in and move the trees over a few feet because they had an irrigation line buried um, and you planted it right over top of that um, that can turn into a very expensive proposition too so but soil preparation with your organics um, are <clears throat> Probably the biggest issue. Pretty much. And selection of your planting materials. Know your trees. Right. Yeah. There's a saying, right tree, right spot. Yeah. And before you put that tree in the ground, make sure you got the right tree in the right spot. And there's lots of trees that are shorter in stature that tolerate some of the chemicals that are applied to crops and stuff like that, or that re respond well to those chemicals that are applied to crops that are lower headed. You can still plant them under a uh, power line or uh, in, in areas where you have other utilities and stuff like that too. Uh, I don't know if we should get into mentioning names at this point in time, no, probably not. but uh, pre prepping your soil is probably the biggest issue and understanding space. Like if you're, if you've only got, you know, 50 feet to plant in, you don't want to plant three species of trees that spread 50 feet each. Um, get one that's you know kind of your over elm trees for example uh ashes would be another one those those would be your bigger trees and then you interspersing those plantings um and not so much in a formal line that's what i keep seeing is too many too many lines so if you lose a tree you've got a hole um more of a clump planting and that doesn't mean taking all of your ashes and planting them all in a clump that just means planting in a clump because trees don't just bend in the wind they torque um so that would be something to consider there as far as you know weaker weaker branched trees um get somebody in those trees to come and talk to you yeah. <laughs> before before you embark on that um but lots of organics in the soil um spatiality and uh, knowing where your utilities are the three biggest issues that i run into as a, as a private contractor some of the stuff I see when I'm out in the country going by is you'll see blanks in these shelter belts and that, and 
low areas, maybe the spruce don't survive. They get some wet feet there for a couple of years. So you're kind of looking at, you know, is this on top of a berm? Is this down at the bottom of the hill? Um, and adjust accordingly with that plant material. You know what you're planting. That's one thing I noticed is, you know, when people start planting their trees, I've noticed even with spruce trees, they plant them too close. They're within like, you know, 10, 20 meters or whatever. And then once the trees start branching out, they're getting taller, <laughs> they just start overlapping each other a little bit. And they just stay in their, you know, short columns, but yeah. Shading out, yeah. That's that's another one with, uh, with your conifers and your deciduous trees. You want to try to minimize the shading of, uh, of all these different types of trees too. I, I like the pines of the country. Um, and, and I don't really have a preference on any of them other than obviously don't bristle cone because it's only going to get 10 feet tall and that's going to take a lifetime. Uh, but the, the Scots pine are fast growing. Um, Austrian. Austrian pines, yeah. Um, pretty much any of the pines, I don't really have a, a big issue with them. Uh, some of them are more susceptible to, if we went to spraying, and I was talking to Lindsay about this last year actually about uh, if you got pine needle scale on your on your pines, for example, and you've got a five needle pine, there's really nothing we can apply to that tree that's going to solve the problem without us causing more damage. Uh, so the five needle pines, the three needle pines, and two needle pines are, have different characteristics as far as chemical controls. If you get a, if you get an insect on them, um, but yeah, that's so interspersing the, the pines and the spruces is what I was getting at. So if you had a, a pine and a spruce, you had a spruce tree that grows like so. And then you got a pine tree that kind of grows like so. So you could have one spruce, one pine, and they're not really going to shade each other out. And they're not going to grow at the same rates. Um, that would be another another consideration. Diversity. Diversity. Um, in the city of Lethbridge, we have so many ash and elm and spruce and poplar. We are looking, what can we plant? What can we mix in to diversify the urban forest? And... We've gone to great lengths trying black walnuts. We've got a lot of black walnut going out. Lots of oak, lots of linden, um, hackberry, or really honey locust. Really trying to mix it up so we have this diversity in there. A lot of stuff I deal with are invasive species, and I keep hearing horror stories about things coming into North America. Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer is out east. We're watching for that. Asian longhorn beetle is another one out there. Oh, that's awesome. Um, if anybody else has any questions, I don't. Oh, I, I, I got plenty of questions in the queue here. But uh, if anybody else has any questions that they'd like to ask, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Um, can can you uh, plant trees where a stump has been removed? It's going to be a nitrogen sink. Uh, if you've got a tree that was in there, all the roots are left. If they come in and completely stump ground or dug it all out and replaced it with new soil, uh, you can plant right away. Um, if you plant something in an area where a tree's been taken out, there's two issues that I've, I've, I've seen happening. Uh, number one is it's a nitrogen sink, so you have to have supplemental nitrogen to get them to grow at the regular rate because the nitrates are actually busy breaking down the root systems of the previous trees. The other issue is we have a lot of people recommending diesel treatments and uh, Arlon treatments and mm -hmm. all these different chemicals that they're, they're dumping onto these stumps to kill them so they don't sucker up and sprout and cause further issues down the road to your other trees. Um, now, typically, if you plant a, a linden and you've removed poplars, you're probably not going to get any any kind of grafting. But what, when that when that wood material that they build starts to break down, uh, Garlon, for instance, is very... Um, stays in the soil for a long time. So it can cause issues with your other plantings uh, without grafting just because it's in the soil. So that's that's typically what uh, I, I try to avoid. Uh, if, if, it, if the job is done from start to finish, the removal and the stump is done, and uh, you've kind of amended the soils with, you know, you, I mean, you're gonna need calcium, you're gonna need nitrogen, you're gonna need those, those basic elements in your soil. The soil test and then replant. That's probably the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, Good question, Kathy. What do you recommend amending the soil with? Well, you'd have to base that upon your existing soil. So, I mean, we do a lot of fertilization, and um, the biggest thing that I see is there's no there's no 
it's like you're gonna you're eating eat a meal and you've got a steak and potatoes and all your veggies and everything like that but you know you really don't need anything but protein um so just eat the steak and same thing with your trees it may not need all those extra elements and when we start fertilizing with a complete blend with um you know lots of manganese and the metals in, in particular the irons and coppers and borons and stuff like that uh, we can actually toxify the soil by just putting a generic fertilizer down so i don't recommend anybody just put down anything in general uh, the one thing i've noticed in all of our soils pretty much down here whether it's sandy or heavy clay calcium is lacking so that that's one that you can probably get away with and nitrogen is always used so those two elements you could probably get away with adding to any new planting but first get a soil sample and determine what's missing if you're, if you're missing any one element it affects how the other elements are uptaken by the trees and a stress tree well we're already planting in, in southern alberta <laughs> they're stressed right out of the gate uh then we're irrigating with you know a higher ph you know first few years i was down here i was always testing the sloughs and irrigation water and as the summer progressed the salt content increased in, in our irrigation water so acidifiers would be something that you know you'd want to consider also i mean you might have a perfectly good soil sample uh but sandberg labs is it still sandberg I believe yeah. so. um <clears throat> they always test stuff basically for crops so you have to tell them for you know i'm going to have spruce i'm going to have hackberry and i'm going to have uh, lilac as, as the outside edge um, buffer of my my new planting um sorry i get so far into things and they start rambling uh, <laughs> but yeah get a soil test determine what you're what you're mi missing and then add the nutrients and fill in anything organic you got lawn clippings you've got even straw i mean at least it adds to the porosity of the soil for the oxygen uptake because without the oxygen, nothing else goes into the plant. It's, it's a, uh, you've got to have some air space in there in your soil, soil tilt. Um, I guess a lot of the farmers out there would know more about soil tilt than I would, but um, that's the one thing that I find if you had a heavy clay soil or a really sandy soil, you're going to go through your nutrients much quicker in the sandy soil because it gets washed away. And in your heavy clay soil, it's going to hold it a lot more, but it's, uh, it's not going to go down deep enough to facilitate a lot of use for trees. So prepping your soil, start with the soil sample from a lab um, and then add the nutrients you need and feel free to dump as much organics as down as you want now wood chips are good after not it's not a good soil amendment because it, it sucks out all the nitrates out of the soil and your tree will be lacking in nitrogen so does that answer that yeah actually you made another question come up so what about well water so you're saying that you got to add nutrients based on your water. So, so I guess I'll give you a background. Like, you know, uh, on the Starline Road, I bought one of those places that burned down. So I want to do a shelter belt on the west side. The house burned down. There's a well there. Am I going to, do I have to sample the water and add nutrients based on the water that I'm putting into the soil? Well, well water that. tends to be fairly... Pretty good. I, we've had some uh, tests that you can get it tested too. Uh, we've had some tests come back with you know, high composition of iron or high composition. Trying to remember the other one. Uh, yeah, ba basically the iron was the biggest concern, um, the iron content. So that's why you end up getting rust on your bathtubs and your toilets and stuff like that out in the country. Um, I think it was the other one. Well water. City water. Um, <laughs> I used to have water. Um, so get it tested too, and, and you know you can compare the two. If you're going to be putting down, you know, fifty thousand gallons per season of water onto your shelter belt of a high iron content water uh, on a a low or high pH soil, um, then you're going to want to put some acidifiers in there. Uh, sulfur is, is one. Aluminum sulfate. Be very careful with that. You know, probably best to get somebody that that's done a lot of that to do that kind of thing for you. Um, but yeah, those those are the those are the two components you want to get tested, and your wood chips goes on afterwards. Uh, I, I gotta repeat that because many people are building wood chips in, and then their trees don't they're still alive, but they're not really growing for you know three, four, five, six years. Same problem you have if you leave stumps in the ground. Um, it, it just extracts all the nitrates out of the soil, and you don't get a good a good a growth spurt. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Um, what's a good source of inexpensive apple trees? Are there any apple tree suppliers around here? 
<laughs> Karen Barbie at Greenhaven would probably know. Yeah. Um, she does a lot with apple trees. Um, Greenhaven here in Lethbridge. Um, Brooks Research Station did a lot of work over the years with apples, but they've pretty much shut down that horticulture department altogether. So there are some good old varieties that are out there that they've worked with on the prairies. Sometimes if you've got an apple tree there already, you can just graft on what you want mm -hmm. to start to develop. Um, it's a lot like marriage, it's 50-50, but it, it can be done um, to a certain degree. If you're just looking for new apple trees, um, one of the biggest issues I've noticed lately over the, probably the last 10 years is stuff's not really being grown from seed anymore. It's being genetically altered and, and um, root cuttings and stuff like that. So if that particular tree that you're getting a root cutting from is subject to septoria or fire blight or you know issues like that, whatever your root cutting that you're taking and replanting is, is what it's going to be. If it's growing from a seed stock, typically what will happen is somehow or another, genetically, I'm not a geneticist or anything, but genetically they tend to solve their own issues. So they're not as susceptible to these other problems. Um, and if you are going to add apple trees, um, look up some of the allelopathic relationships. Um, what's the word? Allelopathic. Yeah, where there's 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 certain things that don't grow together in nature, and we put them together, and we end up with problems. The gymnosporangium and uh, issues like that. So just make sure if you're growing apples, they're not upwind of uh, you know a nice Rocky Mountain juniper stand, oh, oh, for yeah. example, or Rocky Mountain juniper stand, and then you know a nice apple stand. You don't, you don't want those in a, in a very close proximity. It's more of a problem in the city that I, I I find. I don't find it so much out in the country. Um, but I have a few uh, sites that uh, we have had that issue developing on it. Um, Elms and Saskatoon is the same same problem. It's not tree killing issues, but it is you know it does stunt the development. Cranberries and uh, there's like 50 of them. But hawthorn juniper, I get, hawthorn juniper. I get a lot exactly. of that in the city, and yeah. it's just these diseases with alternate hosts going back and forth. So you just got to be careful what you're planting with what. Thank you. I have a question for you, if you guys can hear me all right. Mm -hmm. You betcha. So we have a shelter boat, uh, or sorry, we have an acreage uh, outside of Coaldale. Um, there used to be a windscreen up that got taken down. So it used to be windscreen, then poplar, then evergreen, then ash. So the windscreen's gone. Now my first row of defense is poplars. So we're hoping to put lilacs in where those where the windscreen was for a first layer defense but are my evergreens are really or i think my evergreens are really struggling because they don't get any sunlight because the poplars are so big so some of the evergreens have died some of the poplars have died we are basically thinking as some of the evergreens died some of the poplars dying to basically swap spots of those two trees so then the the layers would be lilac evergreen poplar would you, because poplars seem to grow anywhere, would would you suggest that being a good uh, arrangement yeah. of tree or plant? The shading out by, that's what I was kind of discussing earlier, was the, uh, if you, and I think the PFRA had it pretty good for quite a few years, you know, short, uh, tolerant, drought hardy, uh, sorry, chemical uh, hardy species that, is also drought tolerant. So lilac, carrigan, uh, um, and then and then you have your taller conifers, and then you have your taller deciduous as you go from west to east, so that they do get that sunlight. Um, conifers, when they don't get that morning sunlight, tend to have more problems in, in terms of pests, from from my experience anyway. Um, so I, I would I would definitely uh, have that sequence of heights that kind of allows the sunlight to you know hit the conifers. And then when you're planting, don't plant in, you know, 40 feet in, in a row. So your lilac, uh, spruce, and then, uh, you know, green ash, for example, don't plant them in a line. It's a clump planting, just like nature does. Uh, it eliminates a lot of that, those sun issues. Um, that's, that's probably a better one. And, and then if you can, as to Lindsay's point earlier with the diversification, rather than planting just, you know, a row of this and a row of that and a row of this, um, wherever you're taking a tree out, um, 
get rid of that root, the, the, the stump in the root, and plant something else, a different species. Now, we're, we're kind of gun shy on elms. We're kind of gun shy on on uh, ashes uh, at this point in time because we, we we're, we're fun, one fire would load away from another problem, a uh, major problem here. Um, so interplanting of uh, the locusts and the, the locusts, sorry, and the uh, hackberry. hackberries. Get some oak going in there, uh, coming yeah. up. Um, just, I see so much of it. I can't emphasize diversify your shelter belts, mix stuff up in there. And it could be different heights. You could buy the little, you know, three gallon pot or something like that, start stuff. I pick up black walnuts and butternuts uh, here in Lethbridge and I'll take the seed home and put them in my yard and they'll germinate within two years. And then I'm going and giving them out to the college and the university and things like that. And his neighbors. neighbors need to mix it up and neighbors. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's really important to get that diversity in there. That way when you get hit with a problem and Believe me, you will get hit with something. Um, I can drive down any country road and I've done something on at least one of them. Um, and it's usually because they planted, it, they left it and, and have done no, no interplanting. If you plant, replant 5% of your, your, uh, your border uh, plantings uh, every year, you replant something else in there. Uh, you're gonna solve a lot of those problems. And the smaller you plant it, this is another big issue. I see they're bringing in these spade trucks. And I, I, it's either going to make it or it's not. I get people call them fertilize it. Well, okay, we fertilize it, but it, that's not the secret. The secret is getting the tree acclimated to your soil type, your watering regimen, your sun uh, situation. It, it's smaller, it, it gets acclimated better. Now, yeah, I guess maybe a goat might eat it or wow. you know, a, a deer might do on it or whatever, but that's, that's, that's a solvable problem down the road. Um, Getting diversified and, and smaller smaller trees, bare root. Or... Yeah, if you could do bare root. The thing to remember with those poplars too, as you're going in, is poplars grow fast, die young. So, you know, do you great get them going, but then you want to start bringing some other stuff in and maybe getting away from those poplars over time. And in that case, with moving the spruce and the poplars around. Yeah, let's let's slowly get rid of those poplars and see what else we could get going in there, and maybe mix some pine in with those spruce to, you know, diversify the evergreens in there as well. How many questions did we create with that one? <laughs> that was a lot, but yeah, really good feedback. Thank you. Okay. So then, do you guys recommend following? Like, I, I saw online the the agriculture the shelter belts in alberta farmstead shelter belt layout where it does you know like uh like what i i made my order plan based on that it was a row of caraganas then a row of poplars then a row of willows and then a row of the conifers like that's that's the, basically if you follow that you're going to be on pretty good footing i don't plant a lot of shelter belts because i'm in the city but i would mix mine up a lot more than that i i'm not confident Again, a lot of what I deal with are invasive species, and when something gets into Lethbridge, we had a case of Dutch elm disease two years ago, and all eyes are on elm trees right now. I do not want to see that get established here in southern Alberta. The planting plans that they put out are kind of like the same thing when you buy a new car. They tell you to get the oil checked, they check the tire pressure and stuff like that. They don't tell you to plug it in when it gets minus 30. They don't tell you that you can use nitrogen or oxygen in your tires. They don't. There's a lot of things they don't tell you. It's the same thing with this this plan. It's a basic plan for starting of success. Poplars are a great. I, I call them a nurse crop. Um, I, I was up in in uh, where I came from was the Olds area, Olds Red Deer area. So we had a lot of the uh, um, crumbling aspens that would just kind of just take right off, sort of type thing. Uh, they they sprout off of roots. And same thing with poplars. If you're in there rototilling or you're doing something in there. You can end up with a lot of sucker sucker growth, and like Lindsay said, they're short-term trees, 30 to 50 years for a lot of them, not all of them, but for a lot of them. Uh, so you're going to be replanting anyway, so you might as well replant a little bit with that plan in place, and you got it on the table there. Scratch out every second one or every third one or three in a row and plant something else in those three, and then leave two poplars and, and kind of go that route. 
Uh, and offsetting them is very important. It, it's sunlight um, is, is, a, is a big issue for uh, particularly your conifers. They're full sun plants. Um, if you're blocking out sunlight with a deciduous tree, you're going to have more problems, not necessarily right away, but down the road. And that's where, that's where, uh, uh, that's how I make my living is basically on, on bad planting. So um, start with their, their basic program and diversify with other, other specimens. The, I hear that question myself. So um, we were talking about diversity and stuff. What about the various ages within, I, you know, a lot of farmsteads I see around here, they're all the same age. And when they all go, they, like one goes, they all go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're starting to see a lot of that. Um, the Nicholas Schran Park on the west side, the older poplars, they're 60 years old, getting to the end of their lifespan. The ash in there are starting to get mature and we're starting to worry about emerald ash borer coming over there. So we're trying to diversify that park a lot more as well. Um, back in 2009, I think it was 2007 or 2009, it stayed really, really warm right up until I think it was like November 8th and it up to minus 18 overnight. And city on city trees alone, we lost, I think it was 275 green ash, and they were all in that 30 to 35 year old age class. So we lost a bunch over in the older part of West Lethbridge, where they were just getting mature. We lost a bunch over in Park Meadows in the north part of Lethbridge. And these trees froze overnight, and the younger trees were fine, the older trees were fine, but certain neighborhoods just got hammered. And, I, a lot of people's yards where I went in and you know they're like what's going on and just your tree died and it was devastating because that was their shade, shade tree they that house new and you know brought it along for 30 years and then all of a sudden they're losing this tree so it's important to mix it up and have those different age classes coming in there as well that happened again two or three years ago yeah another, another early frost um and I think we'll see more of that just with the way the weather is anymore and it's, you know, up and down, you don't know what you're going to get one day to the next. And I mean, it could affect a lot of different species. So I think it's important that uh, you've just got that mix going all the time. That's really good. Um, I did get a question directed at me. So from Theo, um, where can you buy order shelter belt trees and bushes from? And you mentioned Greenhaven too. Uh, already once. Is there other places around Lethbridge? Um, there's lots of places. Coldale, Simon Boss. Um, yeah. There's a lot of guys out there. If you Google Alberta Shelter Belt, um, there's lots of guys selling trees. Um, it's a shame, really, that Indian Head in, Sa in Saskatchewan closed down that they ran the Shelter Belt program and stuff. And I mean, other companies have taken that over and stuff, but you compare us, um, check out some of the United States Department of Agriculture shelter belt uh, information. They're, they're so much bigger and they spend so much more money than uh, Canada does on this. But um, there's, there's lots of really good info there, but there's a few guys that are growing, you know, all kinds of different species of trees and different sizes. And um, I'm not, I, I don't know any of the names really. We put our stuff out to tender. We get all kinds of things from BC. And like I say, we're bringing in stuff. We've got Kentucky coffee tree growing in a couple of parks just to see how well they'll do for us. Catalpa. Catalpa. Um, doing good until she ran over with the motorhome. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're, we're trying to stretch the boundaries here and you can't always get away with that, you know, on a farmstead or something like that. But we've got these little microclimates that we could kind of push to see what can we grow and we're trying to find that material and bring it in so we can grow it. Um, one guy, I, there was a guy in Barnwell and he had four-year-old shagbark hickories that he had brought in 
he had brought some seed in. I don't know if they're still alive, but he had planted some just as an experiment. If you could grow those, that's great. They aren't supposed to grow anywhere near here, but definitely, you know, try some of these other things and start thinking on a little broader scale. And the old 1930s shelter belt plan, it's like, we got to switch it up a little bit anymore. It's a starting point, but it's certainly not a, not a highly recommended one anymore. Um, I'm trying to grow a moringa tree. Um, that's from the Philippines. Um, because it's really rich in a lot of nutrients. Um, and I've also got a ginkgo biloba. Um, that's, it's about six inches taller. It's only 24 years there's, old now. There's a couple in town. <laughs> but I, I mean, there's a lot more stuff available too from back when, you know, the prairies were kind of settled and stuff and they were planting trees. You didn't have a lot of choice. And that's why city of Lethbridge, we've got ash and elm because they grew well. That's what we planted. Now, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there where Terry and Maples are doing really well for us that I think could fit into a shelter belt program. Um, there's some hardy plums out there, some of the apples, again, um, black walnut and butternut we've been planting. Um, Japanese, tree lilac. Japanese tree lilac is lindens. something. Yeah, lindens. I guess the one thing I would be careful with out in the country if you're doing shelter belt or farmstead planting is smooth bark trees. Because out there, they're so exposed, they're exposed to where they're getting sun scald and they're getting bark splitting from that freezing thawing from the Chinook. So you've kind of got to be careful with the mountain ash and the maple, some of the maples, the Schubert choke cherries, things like that, that, you know, maybe those come in after when you've got a bit of shade there. The nicest mountain ash in Lethbridge are growing on the north sides of houses and garage. And it's just because they're not getting exposed to that sun and Chinook conditions. So, um, yeah, I think it's important you get some of the other hardier stuff settled in first. A lot of those mountain ashes have uh, white bark. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to prevent sun sculpt or painting the bark white. Uh, still have coming up, come up with a a uh, good Latin name for them, uh, but oh. <laughs> uh, I think an Alba or something along that lines. Um, there you go. Yeah, the mountain ashes are, are good secondary tree. Yeah, um, even the, some of the, the newer maples, and they're only smooth not forever, but for a while. Um, so the sun's called is an issue here for sure. We get longer, longer days um, in the summertime, obviously, and that just cooks them. So what happens is the cells get hot and they burst and split out. So you're losing that vascular flow to that particular part of the tree, which now will lead to a dead branch, which will now lead to something coming in to break it down to turn it back into dirt, an insect or a disease. So not immediately planting those types out there. And there's not a lot of options that we have in there, but um, more, more you diversify inside of that shelter belt, um, over the long term, the more more options you'll have down the road. So if you do get hit with something that comes in a fox lung canker and it just goes from one poplar to another poplar, um, if you've got you know 75 other types of trees in there, they're not subject to that particular disease. Um, so you'll, you you won't notice the the issue, and you won't have to spend a whole bunch of money on it. You can just let it run its course, uh, rather than having to have somebody come out and do a bunch of spraying and stuff like that to control it. Um, yeah. Diversify. Diversify. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what about a field trip to um, to people that are doing innovative things with their shelter belts? Um, for example, with drought resistance or um, innovative um, interspecies plantings, just or you know scale like that looks like a park or something like that. What about some field trips? <laughs> uh, that would probably be outside of our scope. Um, Lindsay might be able to do something in the city, um, but I don't know if you could get approval to. Yeah, I'm, kind, I'm of kind of in the city. I'm doing something for the Horticultural Society in Lethbridge. The end of May, we're going to do a little tree walk. So um, that would be something you'd have to get a hold of the Horticultural Society. They may have somebody that's available because that's going to be a volunteer thing. And, and for me, 
every minute of, of my season is like three months long and that's where I make my entire income for the for the year so yeah. I, don't, I don't do a lot of touring we don't do actually we don't do anything <laughs> other than work uh during that period in time and I don't run into a lot of well, actually, I can I can't say I've seen maybe one or two that has put something else in there that was unexpected um, in southern Alberta that I've seen, and I've, all the way up to Pitcher Creek down to the, you know, Mount no Milk River, mm -hmm. um, out to Tabor, and as far north as uh, well, a couple of years ago it was uh, Innisfail and Olds again, but now I'm down basically Clarison, Pitcher. So I don't. See, I haven't seen a lot. So I wouldn't be able to uh, tell you about those types of things. As far as drought hardiness goes, I mean, we we basically know what is drought hardy. We know the, the poplars, the caraganas, the lilacs. The one that I talked to Lindsay about when he got here that he disagreed, so I'm not going to mention it. And <laughs> he's he's got enough problems. He doesn't need me helping to expand the issues. Um, Elms, to a certain degree, are pretty drought hardy. Uh, some some of the best elm trees in the city are are on rental properties that nobody's ever done with. They've got you know they've got the plug chain wrapped around the bottom. They got the you know the extension cord going through the branches. Never been watered. Never been sprayed. Never been fertilized. Never been pruned, and they're fine. And that's why they were planted <laughs> exactly. in copious amounts. Yeah. And now yeah. it's how do we move back from that? Yeah. Now now so. we got to now we got to diversify from that. But as far as tours go and stuff like that, I. I I would think you get a hold of the Horticultural Society. They've got lots of members there that are retired and probably have some time to show us things like that. And a lot of them come in from the country into the city and, and they join these clubs. They probably would know more about that type of activity than, than, than we would. There's not so much government stuff anymore. Um, really downsized a lot. Like um, FRA, you know, the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation um, they're, they're pretty much done. I think the, the Alberta government site, the also is not there anymore. So everything's kind of shrunk and you're going to have to look a little bit. I think we will see more people in the future putting in kind of more innovative shelter belts and farmstead planting. Yeah, I, I just wonder about chestnuts. You haven't mentioned them as a species. We have two chestnuts that are doing really well in our yard. Yeah, can. Can. Oh, there's a few in town. I had some blight three years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, three years ago, uh, I've got about four customers with chestnuts, horse chestnuts. Um, and uh, they had a blight about three years ago. We hit them twice with some fungicides and they're fine again and turned out the, the anchored portions of them uh, and they're, they're doing fine again but I, I would I wouldn't suggest planting that as a separate part of a shelter belt that would be something again where you'd want to include it in after you've got your shelter belt established and it can be protected because birds deer rabbits cattle you name it bring stuff in not, not to mention the wind um, but you want to be really careful with those types of types of trees Fungicides aren't cheap to apply, and to be honest with you, I really don't like using them unless I absolutely have to. Um, so having having trees that are a little more tolerant for our soils, you got a heavy clay soil, you're going to have more bi uh, fungal problems and blight. It, it just holds on to them in the soil for some reason, um, and that's where the roots are. So you're going to end up in the upper canopy at some point in time. So, but they are they're a good tree. Uh, they're a lower headed tree. Uh, I, you are talking about horse chestnuts. Uh, all I know is they're called American chestnuts. Is that horse chestnuts? Ohio chestnuts. Ohio. Ohio American. buckeye. Okay. Yeah, yeah the yep. buckeyes. There's Ohio buckeye and horse chestnut here yeah. in town. They're very similar. Um, but yeah, great trees. We use those quite a bit on, you know, boulevard plantings. There's some. I'm surprised there's one in Gold Gardens and. Wow. I always thought it was a smaller tree, and this this thing is old, but it's a big tree. It's mature for sure, so really nice too. So yeah, the buckeyes buckeyes have been good. I've planted lots of those over the years. Uh, finally, just got one in my house here. Um, they did it, again. It seems like it's a because of our soils. Every every tree we bring in, there's there's a new issue with it, and you want to be able to stay on top of that issue. So you get a shelter belt. I don't see people out there 
affecting their trees on a regular basis until they see a massive problem. So that's why I say get your get your shelter belt established first and start interplanting with those other trees because uh, they do pick up problems. And out in the country, I probably have 25 people that have a buckeye and it's usually you know in the island where they turn their trucks around and stuff like that. So um, it's a specimen tree for them, but you can put those into the uh, yeah into the back. Um, with the chestnuts, um, there is an issue with the seed itself for horses. So you don't want to be having having that out uh, where there's going to be livestock, I guess. I mean, I don't know if it has an effect on cattle or anything, but I've, I've had some, um, some issues with that. The black walnuts are probably the most, uh, and it's, I think it's the jug loan. Yeah, I don't have a lot of cows and horses in the city, so it's not a big issue for <laughs> livestock, is it? I got deer. Well, if the price of gas keeps going yeah. up, I'm going to have to get one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just be aware, like, do your research on these plants because some of them have toxins in them that are that are not good for other plants or other uh, other life forms, I guess the best way to put it. Um, but yeah, they are a good tree. Can I bug you one more time? What about um, cheaper trees at like Walmart or Real Canadian Superstore when they have their, don't buy them? Don't buy them. Oh boy. Wow. None of those trees have ever seen a Chinook, let alone a cold winter. They're, <laughs> they're pretty much almost, I'm not going to say all of it, but a lot of that stuff, it's straight out of California or the lower Oregon. mainland or, you know, Washington where they are just not exposed to the temperatures. They grow fast there and stuff. You see those, you know, cedars. Yellow cedars. The yellow cedars, golden yes. Cedars, they, yeah. they go golden really quick in our country. <laughs> but, you know, they're dirt cheap at Costco or whatever, and I see people plant them, and you go by the next year, and it's like there's two that made it. And it's like, well, was it worth it? It's uh... – I was doing work for the Canada Border Services at uh, Coots. Uh, this is about 10, 12 years ago. And um, there was two trucks there, A-Y-E-R-S trees. So Iyer's trees out of uh, somewhere in Oregon. And something had happened with those trucks. And they sat at the border for 10 days in a sealed truck with no water, no nothing. Um, and, that then, and then they bring them up and they put them on for five bucks a piece and, and off you go. So it's it's not something that I would ever recommend, um, and it's not that company's fault. Something had happened, and they they got they got stuck at the border. But it, it does happen, and they still sell them. They still bring them to sell them. Um, I, I wouldn't buy from a box store. I would, I would, I've had zero. I've never had a warranty tree at, at Greenhaven. I've had very 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 few warranty trees at Cold Hill Nurseries. I've had very very few with um, with Simon Boss. Boss, Simon Boss trees, um, Alberta tree movers. Uh, before they changed hands, uh, I would go up and get uh, specimen trees, bald and burlap and stuff like that, and bring them down and plant them. I had no problems with those. So the local companies, like Lindsay said, you know, with with the if they've been exposed to a chinook or they've been exposed to crap soil or they're grown in crap soil, they're going to be much hardier, much tougher. So you're not going to be rolling through all the different um, replantings, I guess. Thank no you. Box, no box stores. Oh. <laughs> Probably need to sue at Walmart now. <laughs> uh, before I forget, Kathy, too, um, the county can look into doing hosting a tour, uh, shelter belt tour in the future. Oh. If there's if there's interest behind that, um, we didn't do it this year just because uh, with COVID still rampant, um, it wasn't something we were, you know, unsure of, you know, um, but uh, something we could look to in the future. So. Great. Yeah. Um, I did get a, a question from Catherine a while back here. So, uh, what are uh, some effective or effective slash sustainable irrigation plans, and how often to irrigate, and how much? Go ahead. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Again, <laughs> species specific, soil type specific. Uh, you know, know your soils, know your trees requirements. If you're getting into more of the Ohio buckeyes and the horse chestnuts, uh, fruit trees, and, and that kind of, and that light in, in there, you're going to need more watering um, and or a good mulch layer. You know, I, I see a lot of things out there like the uh, the tilling, and they're tilling. They're not tilling deep anymore. A lot of them are getting the message to not go down too deep and rip up those roots, uh, but they're still tilling. And you, what you're doing is you're you're rolling that soil 
that's starting to break down nitrates, bug poop, um, and you're rolling it over top and killing it, uh, exposing it to sunlight, which, which, which basically negates the, the advancement of your, your uh, soil um, microbes growth. So I don't like rototilling at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, some of the grasses are okay. I mean, we plant. He's got a couple trees in in the parks, and people are always kind of, oh, uh, I don't mulch because it's going to blow all over the place. Well, once that mats down together and, and you've got moisture on it, it doesn't blow around. Um, you might get teenagers kicking it around, or deer dragging it around, or bunny rabbits, or whatever. But you're, it's not going to be all over the park or all over your yard. So that is extremely highly recommended uh, as far as mulching goes to contain the water you're putting down uh, or to retain the water, sorry. Um, drip systems, are, I don't know how many times I've been grinding a stump and I hit I hit a drip system. I, I, I put them right beside, the, right beside the planting spot and they never come back and move them. It's kind of like when they put a tree stake in, they never come back and take those tree stakes out, they just leave them there. So 20 years later, you're cutting down a tree and you hit a you know metal T-bar tree uh, spike. Or if you're grinding the stump, you're grinding out the irrigation system. So it has to be a um, an evolving irrigation system for your trees. Uh, some trees you like it to be washed down, some you don't. Um, as as with rain, uh, I've got one fellow just north of um, Burdett. Burdett, yeah, yeah, and he's got a barn with a little uh, looks like a lighthouse. He's got a big sprinkler head over top, and he waters his whole yard with this thing. It just goes around and around. Um, now that's good for a lot of trees, but moisture sometimes can cause more issues with your um, fungus problems or, or uh, insect issues too. So um, I think, yeah, I, I think keep that moisture close to the ground for the most part. And if you've got a drip system or spaghetti tubing, make those plants work a little bit. Like go out there, move it around. It's oh, I'm soaking this side and it's going over here. Make those trees have to go look for that water a little bit. Um, so, and then start moving it away a little bit. Maybe the following year it goes a little farther. For mature trees in town, um, city boulevard trees, I tell people get a little soaker hose out there, run it the length of your boulevard. And three times a year, maybe four times a year, depending how hot, one good deep soaking, like, you know, two and a half, three hours on low it down there so you're soaking down maybe a foot and then let those top three inches dry out and that's driving those roots deeper and making that tree hardier in the long run. The irrigation systems that we typically see are for turf. Mm -hmm. uh, I even took the turf management the turf irrigation good cod. The irrigation course at Lethbridge Community College when I first got down here in 96 and um, it's, it's designed for turf because the turf roots are, you know, two, two and a half inches deep. So the water comes on, it runs, you know, each each zone goes for a certain period of time, which is far too little for trees. You want the trees roots to go down two reasons. Number one, you don't want them competing with the water for the, for the turf because you're going to see surface rooting. Uh, the second thing is if you see surface rooting, you, you may see the bottom side of those uh, surface roots when we get a windstorm. So you want deep, deep watering, like Lindsay said, a good deep watering. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a managed thing. You put the system in, you got to move it. Um, and I, I don't know which one is best for any given situation. Well, for each situation, you can walk in and say that this is a good system. But as a, as a recommendation for you, depending on what you're going to put in there, I can't say. Um, and the more trees that you've got in there, if you've got a lot of conifers and stuff like that, it's going to be different than if you have a lot of deciduous. So, each situation is different, but a good steep watering with retentive uh, mulching is vital. Claire is mud. That's good. No, that's good. Thank you. Um, so for the trees, like getting a shelter belt, rural established, um, like a deep um, probe with water, like once a year, is that what you said? Like one, one and a half feet down for each tree or? Um. It's really going to vary species, everything. You do want that good deep soaking though, as those trees are maturing. You don't want to drown the tree, but we get hot here. Typically, 
we'll get our spring moisture, we get into July, we start hitting those 30 degree days. And by the end of July, those trees are, they need water. And so you're going in every three weeks through July and August, giving them a really, really good soaking, letting the top two, three inches dry out till those roots go deep. Then once we get into September, we start getting the, yeah, nights are, you know, getting longer, the temperatures are getting cooler. And you start cutting back on that water and telling those trees, you need to go to sleep, really. And through the month of September, you keep doing that and making those trees kind of slow down, get ready for winter. And then maybe before you shut the irrigation system down or anything like that, you give them one, maybe two really good soakings. And that's especially important with your evergreens in the fall here, because we get those dry Chinook winds that suck the moisture out of everything. And you want Usually it's all falling apart by October or end October. <laughs> Halloween for the kids is when it usually goes. But um, so that second week of October type of thing, you're really giving them a good drink. So they've taken up all that water and it's going to carry them through the winter months. Okay, thanks. You just put a little comment in there. I forgot. Um, so we are reaching up on, on to an hour here right now. And uh, the Zoom may Zoom link may close on us, but uh, if everyone still wants to continue discussing, um, what I can do is we can wait a minute and then I'll open it up again. And you just click on the same old link. So, um, but uh, until then, uh, I think we would be a good time to get into some disease and insect damage, if uh, everyone's interested. Um, one of the questions I have is. Uh, Insect damage and disease damage that's prevalent here in southern Alberta. I know it's a broad question, but you know, well, there's only one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lindsay's brought a bunch of samples here. Do you want to just show them? I I think we could go through some of the real basic ones. Um, probably your biggest concern with shelter belts is yellow-headed spruce sawfly which typically late June, Canada Day at the latest, you start going around and looking at your spruce trees. Um, usually younger trees that are out in the open, um, once, once they get 12 feet tall, I don't even look at them here. But around that time, I'm going to all our new parks and developments and taking a really good look at all my spruce trees. Usually the south and side of the tree that's the most protective down low and I'm looking for those emerging uh, soft like caterpillars and they're hard to see they, they, you'll see that needle damage before you'll see the actual uh, caterpillar feeding on there um, when I go around I tend to wear a leather glove and I'll just whack them off or squish them as I walk by but after I get through a few different areas I get an idea of if it's a bad year or not a bad year and we might have to send some guys out to do a little bit of screen on some of those trees. So it, if they get going on a good year, they could devastate your spruce trees. And yeah, then you're starting over. Yeah, I've got a couple of indicator trees that I check because they get hit every year. Whether yeah. it's good or a bad year, they get hit every year. But the volume of the hit is what I kind of determine whether we're going to have to do anything about it. And for the most part, if you got four or five branches that are getting hit, yeah, wash it off with your hose. Um, yeah, call it a day. Knock it off. If, if you get Maybe, sometimes you get bad years. Um, I I remember one year where I was getting all geared up, ready to spray, and we had a hailstorm come through, and it knocked them all off the branches, and I didn't have to worry about it at all. So sometimes you get lucky as well. But uh, the other one on spruce is probably this, and this was from one of our trees, um, white pine weevil. And it gives you an idea. And this is the leader at the top. Um, again, early July, that new growth will start to wilt, go down a bit. Um, you can see the top of this where the pots are starting to go. If you're getting this in your shelter belt, get in there, cut that out, get it out of there, burn it or bury it. Um, the white pine weevil, one of the first insects to emerge, they're probably starting to come out now. This time of year, they're either going to crawl up to the top of the tree or uh, fly up there. 
and lay their eggs. And so inside there, the larvae are feeding and they kill it off. That's, and you can see the emergence holes there. That's the holes I'm trying to show you there. I don't know if it's going to work on the camera or on the TV, but we're on the <laughs> computer. TV. Um, yeah. And when you're cutting these off, don't just go and cut a bunch off. Um, cut them off, peel that bark up, make sure that there's not a gallery feeding tube going past that point. If it is, don't feel free to go into the green. It's okay. Uh, and then when they start to come up, you got to go back out and do some. Yeah, usually one will take over and you'll, you know, there'll be some apical dominance and one one of those branches will come back up. Sometimes you might have to go in there with a old hockey stick and tie it until one's taken over and stuff. But we didn't really have a problem with this. The college, I remember when I started in the city, um, there was some at the college. South Homer. Yeah, and in that south end of town and then now it's in Riverstone and West Lethbridge and it's popping up in more spots. But if you're isolated out on an acreage or a farmstead, you just get it out of there so it doesn't get established and start affecting your trees. I mean, it's well established in Lethbridge now. We treat it as best we can, but uh, and there is no chemical. There's control. no chemical control for this, so even my experimental stuff didn't work. It's citric acid and my yeah. my, my garlic extracts and stuff. Nothing. And where the problem with this lies, like my concern is forestry guys in 25 years from now they're going to be dealing with a lot of trees that have double or triple leaders and those are the ones that typically fail in windstorm so you want to make sure you've got that single leader again going into the future it's important to watch that one um, oh okay yeah another one we see lots on spruce especially more mature spruce is a fungal disease called cytospora canker and it's usually it'll kill one branch here down low and another branch over here <clears throat> and excuse me what happens is people are going in there and they might be going in there when it's wet because they can't get in fields so they're going to work in their shelter belts and they're spreading it around maybe on their pruning tools um, things like that it, it's a weak tree disease and it basically gets into open wounds, maybe where you've made some cuts, maybe if you haven't sterilized your pruning tools, and it gets in there, it girdles that branch, all the needles will turn brown and it dies off. And what you could really look for is kind of, excuse me, losing. Sap, like spruce sap is, is typically like clear yellowish. This will be a purpley mauve color, and you'll get this start of these cankers and stuff see it on lots of trees <clears throat> on lots of spruce trees and it could sit there dormant for a long time so we don't worry you know we'll prune it out where we have to but if you've got it in your shelter belt make sure you're going in on dry days again sterilize your tools get it out of there don't leave it in a pile at the end of the shelter belt where it can reinfect everything um, this one and this, let's do that one too. So we debarked this and you could see the typical canker on here where it's died back and slowly girdled the branch, that discoloration there. And that's not uncommon. We see a lot of poplars will get a lot of canker diseases. Um, and then again, that, that spruce tree and that's probably the entrance wound there. The pruning cuts are very important. Nice and clean. And so once you start getting that dye back, you start getting into things like um, some of those other <coughs> cankers. Poplars have all kinds, um, from hypoxylin to what have you. The other thing to watch for is start watching for woodpecker activity, maybe some bark sloughing off, and you'll see some little galleries underneath there and where the insects have been moving through and, and things like that. You can see the squiggly lines. And again, that stuff, get it pruned out of there, get rid of some of those problems. Um, see the, the exit holes? Yeah. That's an exit hole. So once you start getting to this stage, that's when those poplars start coming out and you start thinking, what else am I going to put in there? Um, the tops of your trees. Watch the tops of your trees. If, if the tree is having trouble getting moisture, that's where you're going to see it first. It's not going to get to the top of the trees. So I'm always looking up high in the tops just to see if I'm seeing 
some damage up there. That's a lot of times where your problems will start. Another one you might see on your choke cherries or Schubert choke cherry, and I think a lot of people might be familiar with this, is this is black knot and this is a black fungal growth that's growing on there. Um, back in the 70s, early 80s, came up with Schubert choke cherry, the nice purple tree, and everyone wanted a purple tree. And so the city planted all kinds of them, the Lakeview area and other parts of town. And then Black Knot gets in and we've removed a lot of these now. They just, they struggle with this. I'm not saying don't plant a Schubert, but again, it's a smooth bark tree. Um, you might want to wait till things are established a little more. This is something, again, get below it, prune it out when you see it. Lots of it in the river valleys. And when you make that pruning cut, peel that bark back and make sure there's no staining. It should be nice and clear, consistent uh, ambial wood underneath the bark. So if you still have staining, go down to the next node and so on and so forth. I usually start on Schubert's right at the bottom. <laughs> Get rid of the problem all at once. Another one I want to talk about, and I don't know how many people have elm in their shelter belts, but probably lots in farm stamps, things like that. For the county office, stop that elm disease pamphlet. There's an elm pruning ban on, starts at the beginning of April, goes through till October. So no pruning this time of year, unless you've got something broken, crashing down, things like that. It's a hazard, you could, you could get that out of there. If you do have to cut something, get rid of the wood, burn it or bury it immediately. Um, I trap for beetles that carry this disease. So elm bark beetles go into the elm trees, they feed, and then they'll move to a healthy tree to feed and they'll carry those fungal spores with them and infecting another tree. My understanding and what a fellow that I've talked to from Saskatchewan, he says a lot of these corporate farms in are coming into places in Saskatchewan, buying up the farmsteads, knocking everything down, cutting down the shelter belts, and during COVID, there were a lot of people that weren't, work, weren't, weren't doing any working and decided to go camping, maybe in Alberta, and started moving firewood. And he figures that's how we got Dutch elm disease in Lethbridge. It probably came in on some firewood and some beetles that got into town. So don't move firewood. If you're going camping, buy it on site and burn it there. Don't bring it back. Don't go hauling wood all over the countryside watch your elm trees you're going to see usually end of june beginning of july again when it starts getting hot you'll see that wilting in the upper canopy leaves start turning yellow turn brown curl up and hang on the tree if it's infected later in the season it might drop its leaves prematurely but if you see anything get hold of the stop dead hotline the only way you could tell is to sample i send samples away almost every year from public and private yards in Lathbridge and surrounding area. We'll get a call, we'll go out, we'll take that sample. Um, I think Gary from the county took the, he went through a workshop last year on how to do the sampling and things like that. But if you do see something, don't just ignore it and go, eh. And you'll know, the tree will look sick. It's not just gonna be a little branch or something. Like they crash hard, they look terrible. So don't be afraid to get hold of someone to take a closer look at it. This, we do not want this in Southern Alberta. So. And there's probably a lot more out there. So any questions on some other ones? That's just a sampling, a sample of what is, is going on. So it, it pays really well to have somebody that's qualified to come out and look at your trees, put together sort of a plan for you. Um, most of the guys that are in this industry aren't going to come out and just voluntarily spray with, you know, dimethoate and stuff like that. Um, they're going to come up with a plan, you know, you got to change your watering, you got to, you got to scrape this off, you pressure wash that, you got to feed it with certain components. Uh, you know, copper is really good for uh, controlling your, your bacterial blights and stuff like that. So there's, there's different things that can be done and it doesn't always mean that you call the guy out and he's going to come out and charge you. I mean, 50% of the sites I go to, I walk away from, uh, we don't have to do anything. It's going, it's going to solve itself. Um, these are really resilient. Yeah. They, I'm amazed. I, I see the damage done from 
you know, sewer lines, gas company, everything else, mowers banging into them. My driveway. I, your driveway. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things out there. And trees, they're, they're really resilient. They can take a lot of things. I think out in farmsteads, acreages, disadvantage you folks have is you don't have a lot of the good bugs I have. I have a lot of predators and parasites within the city that I rely on to balance that population out. And birds. if birds, if I, we haven't sprayed anything, but I don't think soap and water for probably the past 10 years in the city of Lethbridge. It's so hard to spray anything anymore. There's always someone that, that, you know, has a concern, things like that, which is understandable, but I do everything I can not to have to spray and I rely a lot on predators and parasitism. And I've got 50,000 plus trees to look after, so I can put up with a little more damage than some folks. Well, and when they get hit with an insect, the tree automatically sends its own self-defense <clears throat> mechanisms and that includes funguses and viruses and any kind of disease. So running in and hitting it with, you know, the malathions and the dimethoates and the, the carbarils and stuff is probably the worst choice you can make because now you're making the tree dependent upon that application for, for, for every time it happens because it has no self-defense. It doesn't know there's something wrong. Um, and I'm saying that too. That's all I've used, like dormant oil in the spring and safer soap during, during the, the, the rest of the season sort of type thing. I think we did uh, half a jug of Dacanil fungicide on uh, some guy out by uh, Claire's home last year. That's the only other chemical I've got. I'm going to die with the you know, plethora of, of chemicals in my, uh, my disposable, but they work, but they they only work short term. It, it's not a long term solution. Get your trees healthy, water, water, water. Water, water, water. Six, and, six times. Yeah, that's the big thing. Keep your trees healthy. That, uh, that is number one here. And get I, them pruned once in a while. But yeah. I see this annual pruning thing too. Is, like, 10, our, our boulevard trees on city streets are on a 10-year cycle. And they'll probably be going to a 12-year cycle because we've got more and more trees going. But it, they don't need a ton. Like I say, they're really resilient. They can hold up to a lot, make sure they're getting a drink of water. That's my biggest headache. And, you know, give them a little bit of care and attention, check on them. Stuff like aphids, whatever. They're aphids. But, yeah, yeah, that's, not I, gonna, that's not going to kill it. It's not going to kill your tree. You can call pretty much any, and I'm, I'm going to say this with a, a side note, any certified arborist is going to come out and take a look at your trees and give you a better idea of what's, what's, what's needed or what, what, what's recommended, I guess, would be the best way to put it. And there's a lot of guys out there that are not certified that do really good work too. So don't be, don't be just mm -hmm. focusing on the, the certification. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a vital yeah. step to show that they've got some conscientiousness as, as to what they're doing. Uh, and there's a ton of companies in town here, uh, this, uh, you know, and, and surrounding areas. I, I'm, I'm free and impartial. You could email me, lindsay.bell at lethbridge.ca. It's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y dot B-E-L-L at lethbridge.ca. Send me a picture. I, I'm not going to promise I'm going to come out to your farm or acreage to take a look at it. If you give me a close-up of the problem and then something to scale to give me an idea how big it is, you know, where put, is? put a pen in the picture, and then something farther back where I could get some aspect or slope or anything like that, and I'll try and give you an answer or at least try and shoot you in the right direction. And I'm not free or impartial. Right. <laughs> I don't have a pension. <laughs> but yeah, Lindsay's a great resource. He's got all the contacts, the network. He's been down here. I mean, he was here when I got here. So um, I, I definitely look to him as a, as a mentor and a, a good person to bounce ideas off of. Um, so yeah, he'll definitely be able to help you out. I do, I do go out of town. I'm out, out of town a couple times a year because I have a buffer zone around Lethbridge where I do place some insect traps. So if it's at the right time, you might catch me and I might be able to swing by. I've stopped before on stuff and 
Um, it just depends. My my wage is paid by the citizens of Lethbridge, so I can't spend a lot of time going out doing other places. You want me here in town looking after. And he does work like a dog. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> just, I just had to put that out there. <laughs> Any other questions? You talked a lot about diversity in your shelter belts. So I ordered, I guess it's kind of too late for me now, but I'm hoping that I can maybe add some into what I'm about to do. So I ordered the first row to be Caraganas. I was going to do a Caragana hedgerow along the West. Yeah. What would you put in to diversify that? Because I've seen a lot of like, I've seen sea buckthorn, I've seen buffalo berry, choke cherry and Russian olives. And I don't, I didn't know, like, I just know that all the farms I've been to and that I grew up on, all had caraganas, so you just put caragana. They were you can't go wrong with caragana. No. They are they are solid. I if I did something today, I think I would mix maybe some late lilac in there with it. Um a lot of old shelter belts. Um they had some Tateri and honeysuckle. Elderberry. Elderberry. Sometimes that elderberry will die back to the ground certain winters. Um, Grant has had success with the sea buckthorn. Just got to be careful with some of that, that some of these plants, if they're too happy, they'll really start to go on you. And I know in Eastern Canada, they don't want you planting tateri and honeysuckle. It, that's invasive. Norway maples are also invasive in Eastern Canada. And we plant them here in town. Um, we need the diversity. But just, you know, you kind of got to be careful. Um, choke cherry, western choke cherry, I, I'd be so kind of scared. Yeah, well, and, and just spread, like, once they get going. Um, it's the same with the sea buckthorn, too. Yeah. It can. So I try to get it so that it's it's between a rock and a hard place. It's the best way to put it, I guess. Field is there, so they're tilling all the time. And then on the other side, I got conifers, so they don't get, they're not encouraged to go back into the, uh, the shade. They won't grow in the shade. Um, <clears throat> if you have them planted with weather deciduous, you're going to have a, a sea buck burn yard. It, it, they will take over. So well, that's the same caragana. I saw some pictures of someone in the peace country that had planted caragana and neglected it for like 30 years. And this was like a, a forest, like of solid, you weren't getting through there. If you know if it's on the edge of a, of a cultivated field, yeah, caragana is great. Yeah, because that was my plan to do a row of caraganas and then poplars and then the willows is kind of how I had it planned. Just mm -hmm. like I said, based on that recommendation, I'm just thinking if there's anything I can do to because I've already ordered and bought all the trees, so yeah. I'm just trying to think what can I put in there, and you know I'm going to start planting them kind of first second week of May what would you recommend to, to bolster that arrangement? Pine, pine in there. Is it a wet spot? Like with the willows? No, it's uh it's it's up it's up on a hill. It's it's well drained. I okay. think it's sandy there. Okay. Um I am I'm not really a big fan of willows down here because they break so easily in the wind. Like they they're you see a lot more of them once you get red deer and things like that. Um, There's a canker disease. Zone. Yeah, and they're another one, grow fast and die young type of thing. And they do better with water. I mean, we're so dry down here. Like that's why caragamas, they, they just, yeah, you can't really go wrong with those. Before the mountain pine beetle, if you drove through, drove through like a Merritt or just outside of a Soyuz, something you see where they don't get rain, essentially the, the trees that do the best are your 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 pines um being saying logical that's not for the tree <laughs> uh, the pines do very well in, in drought situations now after they're established they do well in drought situations you still have to get an established with an irrigation system to get them going but it's going to give you some some wind buffering and they're tough they, they take the wind they don't uh mm -hmm. don't fall apart and 
The other advantage is you can still kind of see through so they don't get as much of the torquing. The wind can go kind of go through them rather than just hitting that solid wall of like a, a Colorado blue spruce. It's, it's a solid thing and causes a lot more wind tunneling and vortex on the back side of your um, windbreak. Windbreak, yeah. So you, you, you want something that can kind of roll and let a little bit through um, without, uh, without damaging the trees and the willows. Or, yeah, I mean, I, I see it all the time. And they're the first one, first ones to typically go if there's a chemical application that, that picks up the chemical and it hits it, they're spraying a field. The willows are the first ones to go. And then they just suffer from canker and um, it, they're not, not, not specifically no. a, a very good tree. So interplanting that with something like the, the other lady with the, the horse chestnuts. Uh, might be a, a good thing, or maybe even honey, honey locust. I mean, yeah. they're they're very uh, yeah. high salt. They they grow in in Utah. They do fantastic in in high pH soils. So nice thing about those willows is you're going to get some growth out of them right yeah. off the bat, and that, then you've got something that you could work with, and you could start fitting other pieces in there and stuff. Um, a couple of things Grant mentioned: lodgepole pine out on the prairies here, they struggle. It, it's a little too alkaline yeah. for them. I don't see a lot of nice lodgepole pines. So even though that's a native species, I, I'm yeah, yeah and more right. north I or into the foothills. That's something I would kind of stay away from. I think Scots, the Austrian, um, Western whites. Yeah, um, Douglas fir. I can get some Douglas fir. Uh, that would be something that would be good in there as well. But um, some of those, where we've got the room in our bigger areas, we've we've gotten really good luck with ponderosa pine. Um, so those would be some. The other thing, what, oh, you mentioned the damage from chemical damage. Manitoba maples uh, in the corners of your shelter belts and farmsteads, really susceptible to 2,4-D damage. So those are kind of your indicator trees and they make really good tree forts and tree climbing trees for kids. So in all your corners of your shelter belt or, or farmstead, good they're, they're a good tree to tuck in there just so you could see if they came and sprayed your ditch recently. Especially if you like maple bugs. Yeah, that's, don't get a female <laughs> one. The little black and red maple bugs will drive you nuts. <laughs> Awesome. The um, moving on a little bit of maintenance here. I got a question. And I've, I've seen it quite a bit. Um, so deterrence for deer and other wildlife from damaging small tree stands during the winter season. Santa Claus bells. <laughs> really? I'm not kidding. <laughs> I I was spraying thigh ram. We were using blood meal. We were spraying, uh, like uh, in cans and and everything. And I do Santa Claus every Christmas. Well, I haven't done it in the last couple of years, but. I do Santa Claus every year um, and I had gone and bought some new ones and I've got the little community garden that I've established behind Adams Ice Arena and another one out in Coldale. And it's edible forest basically with uh, plums and cherries and apples and stuff like that. And the deer just beat the crap out of these things. Um, so the one day it was just before Christmas, I stopped, there's a buck doing his business on the tree and I opened up the door and the Christmas bells that I got for my wrists, for my Santa thing, fell out on the ground and that whole troop of deer took off. Hmm. Now, I don't know what it is about Santa bells, <laughs> but it works. So I take a little zip strap, wrap it around the branch, two bells, clip it in there, tighten it and leave, leave, leave it loose. When they touch that, they just take right off. Um, now, I had to the sleigh. Don't want to get, <laughs> they're unemployed deer. <laughs> so that's what worked for us. Rick Harder's ranch down at the river bottom. He planted a bunch of, uh, uh, well, I planted a bunch of elms for his, his roadway. Uh, and the deer were just destroying that. And, and we, for 10 years, we were down there trying something different every year. Little car fresheners, little pine car fresheners. We tried those too. Like nothing gave them season long results. I've had the bells on these trees over here, to, mm -hmm. uh, other than the teenagers, which steal them, but I buy the box now. <laughs> uh, that seems to keep them away. If, if in contact with the tree, it doesn't keep them off the property, but it keeps them away from running against the tree or nibbling on the tree. And now the rabbits won't even touch them because mm -hmm. it tingles. So there's something, something about these mm -hmm. bells. 
we page wire all our trees in the city now. Mm. I get, we, we wrap them all. It, there's a lot of deer and we can't afford to get back and replace all the time. So pretty much ours get a tree stake and a wrap. One bell's enough? Huh? One bell's enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm, we're going to have to try those Santa bells. Yeah, that'll be good. Interesting. Yeah, especially on your smaller fruit trees. Like I, I wouldn't recommend hanging off an elm tree, obviously, but yeah. um, for, for the down low stuff where they really go after, because the fruit trees seem to have more sugars and seems to be more attractive to them, especially in these open yeah. spots where there's no fences or no dogs or no people for that matter. Uh, it's it's kind of tough to keep them off. Uh, but that that that's what has worked for the last, I'm going to say three years, because the last two years I didn't do Santa. So yeah, it was three years ago that I discovered it. Um, and it was completely by fluke. So, I don't know, maybe maybe bigger cowbells with a Calgary Stampeders logo on it would help. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard uh, urinal cakes work. Yeah. I, I don't. I've heard that a lot. I read a lot on the internet. I don't. Know if um, that, mothballs. Um, right, man. I don't know. Different things. The CDs, blank CDs that swing in the wind, ribbons. I think the big thing is try and mix it up a bit. So they don't get comfortable with it. And it's like, oh, it's balloons. People have done balloons. So from the country, you guys got something we don't have. It's called lead that we could use. So if you know some deer hunters in your neighborhood, maybe have them visit. Good. Um, anybody else got any questions on maintenance concerns? Nothing. Oh, okay. Water, right. water, water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. No. So if uh, nobody has any any other questions, um, we'll uh, end it here. Um, Grant, Colin, or Grant, Colin, Grant and Lindsay. That was awesome. You guys are very very knowledgeable in your guys' field. So I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day today to sit down with us. Actually, Lindsay's a ventriloquist. I'm his dummy. <laughs> uh, no, I we appreciate it. You guys did, yeah. It was, that was an amazing talk. Um, even I learned a lot of stuff. When I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to using those Santa bells, honestly. <laughs> there's so much. There's so much out there, and so many unique situations. It's I, I, I tell this to people all the time. Get a guy and hang on to him, because once they get busy they're not going to always be coming out to those, those same sites right. find somebody stick with them uh all the other companies even if they don't have an applicator or they don't have a guy that's uh, overly knowledgeable it's getting better we just had two girls from mm -hmm. ladybug arborists and uh, they just went in and got their uh tree insect disease oh yeah whatever yeah. it's called oh good yeah so you know it, it our market is filling when i got down here there wasn't the only guy was climbing was free climbing mm -hmm. um or what I call one bouncing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, the industry has grown a lot. There's a lot of knowledgeable people out there. They may not be able to apply the pesticide that you need, but at least they can tell you what, what you need to do or what you need to address, or even if you need to address it. Uh, Avoid the door-to-door -door guys. Yeah, if, if, if they're knocking on your door, they're not busy. So yeah, yeah just stay away from those. So I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're cementing everything next year. <laughs> <laughs> I got one last question um manure for bare root trees is it will it burn is it a good idea i would compost it for a season at least it's hot it's it's hot yeah and what it does is it it, it sucks the moisture out of the soil which dehydrate your root system uh, it's not just necessarily the nitrogen burning it but it's 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 hot that it it's, depletes the soil and it kills, kills microbes in soil too i mean it's it's a good with with straw with you know, yeah, you, you got to be careful. Um, we still got a pile of old manure down in the river valley here from an old feedlot and the salts are just so high in it um, just from the urine that it's unusable. Like it's just sitting there um, doing nothing, but be careful where you're putting it and maybe experiment a little bit first. If it's blended with a bunch of other stuff and it's been sitting for a season or two then it, it's not really a big issue, but you have to, be. the buffer is the other other organics that you're mixing with it. And again, I would mix that in with a bunch of wood chips and my grass clippings and my, my 
leaf rakings, whatever, whatever, whatever other organs you can get. And then I would let it sit for a season and then I would apply it. Um, in small doses initially. Yeah. To yeah. Make sure. It's, 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 I mean, long term it's great, but short term it causes a lot of fun. It just sucks that moisture right out. I've, I've had my pH meter on there and like it doesn't go that high. <laughs> so I'd be really careful with the, uh, the organics that way. We use seaweed extract as our, uh, uh, our organic component for soil uh, amendments and we have great success with that and I get a lot of people say well you only put you know four plugs or five plugs for each tree and again what that can do is cause issues too because you're changing the composition of that soil in that particular spot so you have a whole bunch of roots growing there and then they're not going out past that point so that's where the fertilization organic or synthetic fertilization is more of a problem more often you do it so you know we, we've gone into places they've had a terrible situation develop and, and we go and we fertilize and we come back sometimes the next year and do it again um, i don't ever recommend that that becoming a day-to-day -day or a, an annual process it, it's just you're going to cause problems i guess the best way to put it and don't fertilize too late yeah june 15th is our cutoff date A great question, Justin. Uh, anybody else before we go? Doesn't sound like it. Hey, no, thanks again, Lindsay Grant. That was amazing. Uh, thanks for everybody that came to come and participate with us here today. And uh, thanks. I well, appreciate you putting that on. That's uh, yeah, that's great. It, it helps. It helps disperse the the information at a much higher level. Yeah. Obviously, if they have people that are interested in you i mean you put a, something in a, in a newspaper you put something on the radio and until it affects them they don't listen so in this situation everybody that's there is is, is listening oh for sure um for anyone that uh, is here or you know anyone that watches on youtube uh we do the lethbridge county website does have total information uh just have also like uh, uh information on establishing shelter belts uh, pruning in the wear time We've got videos on there too. So if anyone's looking for more information, just just went by the Lethbridge County website. It's on. It's under the egg service topics under uh, departments. So, but uh, yeah, thanks to everyone, and uh, look to see you all again in future webinars, I guess. So enjoy your summers. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks guys. <clears throat>